All right, I think I'm set up now. This is Leanna Levine. Uh, I'm the founder and president of A-Line Inc. I'm here today to present about some aspect of plug and play microfluidics and the ability to create standards and engineered components to simplify and speed product development in microfluidics. The title of my talk is called Drop-In Engineered Fluid Circuit Components, which improve reliability in microfluidic product development. Um, I'll be presenting, however, uh, the other engineers in our group, Stefano Bigolo and Eric Ju, also contributed to this presentation. Uh, first, a little bit of background about A-Line. Uh, our company was founded in 2003, so we've been at this now for about 17 years. The company was founded with the thought that, uh, especially back in 2003, it was very difficult to get high quality microfluidic prototypes. So I had the idea that to better serve the product development market, I would set up processes and strategies for being able to do rapid prototyping of microfluidics, principally using laser cutting and lamination and developing over time these drop-in engineered components, working with a number of clients over many years to think about and solve some of the important engineering problems in microfluidic development. Most of our customers are developing single-use point-of-care cartridges, uh, typically for uh, testing either in the doctor's office, although more recently, more of these have moved into the home. We've developed multiplex fluid handling manifolds for life science analysis and custom cell culture and organ on chip devices and wearables. So we've participated in many of the major themes that are going on in the field of microfluidics. It's, uh, it's a very exciting time to be in the field and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts about this whole the things that go into product development and how engineered components can help to make these things more streamlined. So this is our team. Uh, Dr. Stefano Bigolo is our director of engineering. He's been with us for about five years. Dr. Eric Ju started with us this summer. Uh, he's a recent grad from Caltech from Rostam and Smogolov's lab. And we're very glad he's, he's joined our team. So as I uh, want to frame what it is I want to talk about, I kind of want to go back to some first principles and that's to think about these developments in terms of the analytical requirements. So this graphic shows something I think that you're all certainly aware of and that you've had to deal with in the research lab before, but to really understand what it is that we're shooting for in product development with microfluidics. So we know that we need a test that's valid and reliable, that it has the right accuracy and performance. So we know that in these top two images, it's not really, uh, if we have a system that behaves this way, this isn't going to be appropriate for a product. However, if we look at the bottom two images, the one on the lower right, shows a cluster of, of measurements that are not only right in the center of the target and are accurate, but they're also cut, clustered very closely. It may not be possible in many of the product developments that we're doing to get to a cluster of points that are that close, that represent that tight of precision. It might also be true that we could have pretty decent precision, but we could be off from the accuracy, certainly not as far off as this image shows, but what's important to understand is how far away from the center of the target can you be and how scattered can, can the data be and still be good enough to be viable for a product. So I think that's some of the thinking that's very foundational to transitioning from something you would do in the research lab to thinking about how to develop a product and how to specify that product in a way that allows you to scale it for commercial production. 
So just to sort of uh, think about this, these points a little bit more, so what are the characteristics of research and development efforts, which most of you are most familiar with? And what you have available to you are high precision analytical instrumentation. You can overspecify the system, which means you can drive a great deal of precision into certain areas of what you're doing uh, in order to minimize propagation of errors. And you also don't have the constraint of thinking about what it would take to build a million devices. You only need enough to demonstrate the, the, pro the proof, uh, some of a minimal proof of concept and the ability to show that what you're doing actually works. This is in contrast to the way you need to think about product engineering. So the, the objective here is how can, you get, how can you get to something that's viable with the least amount of precision because precision is expensive, whether it's buying precision components for instrumentation or whether it's having to engineer in a great deal of precision into the cartridge in order to get the right functional performance. So how could you design a product that uh, will meet the performance requirements but allow you to manufacture it for the cost of goods that's attractive in the market? Part of what goes into that is to identifying a few key specifications for the cartridge that will allow you to benchmark reliable and valid performance in the system. And then it will also allow you to achieve scale without a loss in reliability. So this is a very different mindset from what you do in the laboratory. And, and this is really the part of the, the service that we provide to our clients that we really enjoy. So having been on both sides, having been both in research and development and now in product development, it, it's really fun and challenging to think about how we can help people create the right path and the right planning in order to get to a product. So in research, we use tools with, with a great deal of accuracy and precision. And like I mentioned, this allows you to control the propagation of errors. So if you think about the whole system, this is some of the classic equation from, from PCHEM, where your interest, where the uncertainty of your measurement is the sum of the, the square root of the sum of the independent variables and the uncertainty in those. So when you have high precision instrumentation, you can drive down the uncertainty in certain parts of it. And for those parts that you don't know as well, uh, you can allow them to drive the precision uh, in the system. So what we want to do in product development is think about how we can uh, deal with greater levels of uncertainty or less precision, but still come up with uncertainty in the system that, that is still consistent with a good quality product. So there's really, there's four technical questions to iterate in product development. And these are the things that, that we as developers, when we support our clients, we come back to these questions over and over again in the course of the product development. So first, of course, you need to define what are the performance requirements. Uh, what are the volumes? What are the reagents? What's the timing? Um, what is the limit of detection? How fast? Uh, and then what you also need to do is be able to benchmark the assay itself or, or whatever it is you're trying to measure with some gold standard measurements that you've done in a laboratory with analytical instrumentation so that you know how far you're uh, varying from what you know is, is good performance with high precision. And then you need to identify and mitigate risks. And many of the risks in these systems have to do with what happens when you engineer and bring multiple disparate components together into a system. You have a bunch of interfaces to deal with. You've got the interface uh, of the assay reagents within the the materials in the cartridge, then you've got the cartridge interface to the instrument, and of course you've got the instrument interface to the user. So planning for and working out the scenarios for 
how things could go wrong is really important and it's really part of the regulatory process for product development. And then finally, the quality. So it, when you're manufacturing more than a handful of parts and you start scaling up, how are you going to know that every device that you produce is going to be functional and fall within the precision and accuracy that's required for the product? And to do that, you need to come up with some quality metrics. Um, what you don't want to do is come up with quality metrics that are expensive and time consuming. So being smart about your how you define the quality is very important in order to get to a viable product. So as I mentioned, the, the interfaces drive the complexity in the system and, and therefore they, they are also decreasing the reliability. And I think the best way to deal with the complexity is to first uh, think about how to make the assay as simple as possible. The assay is really the heart of the system. If the assay doesn't work, it doesn't really matter if everything else works. So getting the assay to work with the cartridge and then getting the cartridge to interface appropriately with the instrument is, is the progression that will lead to the greatest success in developing these products. At the same time, you can look at, uh, at the human factors component uh, at the interface between the human and the instrument and uh, contemplate all the ways that a, a random person off the street could, could screw it up. And so those are the things that if you come at it from both directions, you can come up with a robust and a high quality product. So the way we work with clients is to have a phased approach for the microfluidic development. Uh, the first two phases, what we call phase zero and phase one, really seeks to minimize some of the major technical risks in the product development. We're focused mostly on uh, identifying what the right fluidic components are, uh, what we see are the key risks, and then working through those to, to get a, a, a preliminary answer and then work quick, quickly to integrate, to get the entire assay protocol working in a development fluidic chip with a development breadboard instrumentation. Typically that can take uh, anywhere from three to 12 months, although we like to see these things happen certainly within the first three months. It really depends a lot on the complexity of the assay and what are the definitions of the, what the product, how the product has to perform. And then later on in development in the phase two and phase three is when you're transitioning into a more product-like uh, system where the cartridge now has the reagents on board, it has the blisters or whatever the reagent containment strategy is, and you now have the instrument actuating the, consu the consumable cartridge in the system, and you're now working out more of the performance bugs and the failure modes that crop up as you do more and more tests. So, you know, overall, and I think anyone who's in this field and you're looking at getting investment and you're looking at how long it takes to get a product to market, recognizes that this is a, a very hard process and it takes a long time. Uh, I, I saw a, a presentation not too long ago where the average number of years to get a new diagnostic product to market is typically eight years. Um, of course, we know now with COVID, people are, have the opportunity to speed up that timeline because the regulatory constraints have been loosened quite a bit. Uh, and uh, really the product gets to be validated with the population rather than in a, a, a controlled clinical trial. But um, I think if you think about how the development breaks into phases, the first two phases, people work with the mindset of trying to make it work at any cost because the key deliverable for the next level of investment is to demonstrate that the cartridge will, will run the complete assay protocol with, within the target or within 10 or 20% of the target on time, limit of detection, 
and sensitivity uh, with semi-automated control. And that's a key milestone for many of our customers. And this is a, something I think that we really specialize in is helping people get across that finish line quickly and with good quality data. The next phase of the project then, as soon as you're able to demonstrate that the cartridge works, the assay works in the cartridge, how are you gonna make it work at target cost? And so now you have to consider the design for manufacture and um, the mindset then almost immediately changes from not making it work, but now making it work at target cost. And this is where uh, the thinking about how you can simplify, take out complexity, um, reduce the um, reduce the number of reagents that are required will help you get to the, the, the cost of goods targets that's important for the product in the marketplace. So the way this kind of looks during the course of the program is, is that you start off with something that has fairly high technical risk and the rigidity of the specifications is very low because you really don't know what the specifications should be. But as you move along the product development path, the technical risks diminish, yet in the course of doing that, you've defined specifications that make it more difficult to make any dramatic changes, which is why early design for manufacture and thinking about the cartridge architecture early in the program is very important if you plan to get to a final cost of goods that's appropriate for the marketplace. So the, even now uh, when we start a new program and because we're experienced in this space, um, customers will often ask for us to provide a budget and a target cost of goods when we, before we ever even get to the first design. And we're able to do that because we have the experience having done it before and because we understand what the typical cost of manufacture would be for, for different parts of the system. So if we go back to what are the requirements for the product, uh, the first thing that we need to do is, is achieve proof of concept. So you start off with a workflow for a schematic and really the first thing that you need to do in this development is to determine and, uh, um, and create the specifications for the, the variability at, uh, for the precision and accuracy in the detection system. So defining how you're gonna do the detection, what the flow cell geometry and the materials are, what the reagents are, and even doing this manually and having an interface to whatever the detector is that you're planning to use set up in a, in a breadboard system is very important. Uh, you can't get very far with the rest of the development and there's no point in integrating in more of the complexity of the fluidics if you haven't really defined what the detection volume and uh, configuration should be and making sure that that's a robust uh, configuration to get good, good data. So this is gonna require a lot of science, this is still very much on the science side where you're looking for the assay uh, performance, part manual, uh, part uh, maybe just using uh, some syringe pumps or peristaltic pumps to deliver the fluid, collecting the data, could even be in a microtiter plate reader if you set up the consumable in a way that you can do that and just identifying what the right geometries are for the detection part of the system. And then you can move upstream to begin integrating uh, the rest of the protocol and then have, have the whole protocol and the whole workflow managed in an instrument with semi-automated control. Because the, the most important thing, of course, is to get rid of human error uh, get rid of the variability that comes from having different people do the experiments in the laboratory. So this is an example of a development chip that is used to do measurements 
of across this flow cell that you see in the middle here. So what you're looking at on the right are the pumps. So the pumps that are pulling the liquid from upstream and then pushing it off into waste. And uh, on the left side and upstream of that, you see four different colored fluids that represent different reagents that could be uh, delivered to these four different detection areas all at the same time so that you could do multiplex determinations of the performance of your detection system. So this is the strategy we would use. Sometimes you don't need everything engineered in at once, but as soon as you can get to semi-automated control, the better off you are in being able to get data with good uh, precision and accuracy. So the key deliverable here is to get to that proof of concept system where you've got semi-automated control um, with operating the full schematic, the full workflow that you have in this schematic, and being able to, to then create a specification for the, the design and the materials with the fluidic modules and collect data on the actual performance. And so you have here your proof of concept with extensive characterization with good quality data. The next step in this is, is really, as I mentioned, you're moving to proof of principle, but what you don't want to forget about is design for manufacture, because as you start locking in those specifications, you don't want to be locking yourself into uh, precision where you don't need it complexity and in interfaces where uh, you realize that later on that it's, it's just uh, going to actually add to the variability in a way that you didn't expect. So thinking about the architecture of the consumable early on is important. Where are you going to store the reagents? Uh, how the injection molded components are going to work? And in our case, we have a, a, a valve layer uh, a valve component that is um, what we call our smart laminate that is a component that works with the molded parts and interfaces with the detection aspect to give you a complete consumable package. This general architecture has been used successfully in commercial products. Uh, of course, it might vary depending on the product as to uh, where if are the channels in the laminate are they in the molded part is it some combination of the two but nevertheless the the idea is to make sure that you've embarked on an, uh, a cartridge architecture that will lead to something that, that could be a good product so i guess in summary uh, to kind of look at this whole development process Phase zero and phase one is uh, getting to proof of concept where you have a, a development cartridge. You basically you go from what could be a, a napkin sketch or a schematic to an integrated cartridge that will perform all of the assay steps with semi-automated control. And then in phase two, you bring in the rest of the uh, reagents with the blister packs, uh, bring in the injection molding, and, and then do the, the uh, device architecture so that you can get to something reliable that works well in the instrument. So I wanted to turn my attention now to focus a little bit more on how these plug and play components that we have work with, uh, with the development process. And I, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the engineered laminates that we use for our prototyping and engineering development. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with laser cut and laminate parts. It's, it's a very accessible technology. The CO2 laser cutters are very easy to use and work with. Um, and they make a nice tool for doing all sorts of creative things in the laboratory. But going from that to 
uh, really a, a methodology and a manufacturing process where you can have not only flexibility in the design, but robust production and scale up that's compatible with roll to roll manufacturing is uh, something that, that has taken us many years to develop and involves uh, developing fixtures and identifying specific equipment that we know delivers good quality results over and over again. So the basic approach is it's a true rapid prototyping technology in that the designs are produced in AutoCAD. You split the design into different layers. You determine what the layers are based on the fluid path that needs to be enclosed in the system. The different layers are then machine cut, laser machined into the different lasers or into the different layers. And uh, you consider with the pr pressure sensitive adhesive bonding, design rules are developed so that you get the kind of performance that you need uh, without having leaks or crosstalk among different uh, areas of the chip because of uh, things leaking through when you weren't expecting them to. So once you've got the, the stenciled features and the different layers, they're aligned, stacked, and bonded together to create a complete package that uh, looks something like this. And uh, the reason for the, the NASA logo up here is that th this particular example is a cell culture card that A-Line developed with NASA Ames as part of the GeneSat program that launched back in 2006. So we worked with, with that with NASA and uh, we came up with a strategy for using uh, laser cut and pressure sensitive bonded acrylics to create a cell culture card that had a porous membrane at the inlet and outlet of each well, which allowed the cells contained in each one of the chambers to be contained within that chamber and to also be fed with a single inlet and a single outlet. So this was um, uh, one of the first projects that that we did as a company and uh, we, we actually had to compete with some folks that were doing other fabrication strategies but they couldn't seat the membrane in, in the device with enough robustness that it wouldn't fail because uh, part of this of course was these cell culture cards were part of a satellite package so this got filled with cells uh, covered and then launched into space. So the, these laminate devices had to withstand a lot of mechanical shock and they had to contain the liquid for a month or more uh, while, the, while the satellite sat on, on the rocket pad before it was launched into space. So I, I always like to point to this particular example because it demonstrates that you can do a lot of sophisticated things with double sticky tape and, and plastic. And there are a, a wide number of materials that are compatible with biologicals and that play well even with uh, cell culture. So uh, as part of developing this engineered platform, we wanted to work with a, a fairly small set of materials with some very specific adhesives that we learned were compatible with cell culture and were also optically clear. Not that optically clear is important for performance, but it's important for aesthetics. And it was important because it helped people to see what was going on in the device and while they were doing the development. So we have a fairly small family of materials uh, but what's really nice, of course, about working with pressure sensitive adhesives, it's very easy to bond dissimilar materials. It's also easy to bond laminate components or other things like membranes and vents to injection molded components. 
that the pressure sensitive adhesives are compliant. So even the constraints on your molded part get relaxed because the PSA can actually fill in and cover up some of the uh, inconsistencies that might be in different parts of, of the molded part. So things like sinks and whatever, if they're not too deep, they can be filled in by the pressure sensitive adhesive and have good functional performance. So some of the things that we've learned as we've developed these um, laminates to be reproducible and repeatable uh, and how could we create design rules that would allow us to offer to our customers a really quick way of knowing what things uh, could go readily into a new design and what things would be problematic. Um, we, we kind of developed these design rules based on our experience, as well as understanding what the stack tolerance are, are in the manufacturing process for the laminates. So for example, um, you know, channel widths, although we have a minimum of 125 microns, more likely than not, all the channels that we work with are gonna be 250 microns or more, probably half a millimeter. Channel heights will typically be around 125 microns uh, to 250 microns. Vias will, will be sized to match uh, what the size of the channel. Um, feature densities, edge to edge separation is ideally one millimeter because of the pressure sensitive adhesives. Um, the valve width and uh, length that we like to work with at a minimum is two by three millimeters. However, we've learned there's multiple geometries that, that we can use with these onboard diaphragm valves that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, to get a, a lot of leeway in how you can use them to get different kinds of performance in the system. So regarding the valves, um, here's, here's a, a kind of a table that shows the different components, um, the function of these different components, fluid line toggles work, work with diaphragm valves. Um, because we're working with pneumatic control, we've got four actuation states available to that valve. They can be open or closed with plus or minus seven, seven PSI typically. They could be deadheaded or they could be open to atmospheric. And all of these things become important in considering the, how you engineer the pneumatic control along with the fluid circuit. As you can imagine, if you have deadheaded or open channel ends, that's going to affect how fluid work, how, because the fluids can be connected in the network, how the rest of the network will perform. So the pressure drops in the system are very dependent on the different states of the valves. We can design the channels, geometries, and because we've measured them multiple times using fairly simple-minded uh, quantitative strategies, we, we can design in precision metering channels that have uh, precision of between two and 5% for volumes of as low as five microliters. Um, we can have dispensing off of a vent membrane to, to support um, uh, serial dilutions. And we can use those same valves and pumps to do mixing. And it kind of comes for free if you have valves in the system. And then of course we need air bubble control, which can be done with a combination of um, controlled actuation as well as having vent membranes in the system. So I, I think as, as you've recognized by now that the, the valves that we work with with pneumatic control all depend on having an external control of fluid actuation. And um, while there's a drive to eliminate instrumented control, 
instrumented control allows you to do a, a lot of things in a cartridge that you can't do if you have a passive system. So in terms of multiplexing and uh, higher levels of quantitation and performance, it's going to be easier to engineer that with active instrumented control than to rely on passive control. Passive control is going to require more precision in, in the materials and the fabrication process because you've shifted the control into those components. But with instrument control, you have the opportunity to design it such that the instrument has to do most of the control. Okay, well. Can't do anything about the fire trucks. All right, so here's, here's the, uh, some GIFs that show the valves opening and closing, showing an onboard peristaltic pump, and showing two different volumes being metered into two different channels. Um, so these fluid circuit designs and the valve design and the way they're manufactured have all been reduced to a, a highly engineered, very re re robust and repeatable process. So that if you have a, a overall workflow and a geometry that you're interested in launching into a microfluidic chip, the, the valve and the pumps and uh, the other fluid elements can literally just be dropped into the design and uh, just as if you were to purchase an off-the-shelf solenoid valve, these valves will perform as expected uh, in the device. So the, the engineering aspect of this becomes then optimizing the, the protocol that's managed by the valves and pumps, not trying to optimize the performance of the valves and pumps for the particular chip design. So um, we've had a great deal of success in many projects integrating these valves, not just for point of care, but often for upstream fluid handling manifolds, where these are a nice alternative to a system where you use solenoid valves that carry liquid and you then use those solenoid valves to toggle the liquids in the system. With, with these manifolds, we have the liquids are separated from the pneumatics and the liquids are separated from the instrument. So that's very nice for being able to contain and uh, to control uh, what happens and isolate the fluids from the instrument and that eliminates issues of contamination. So when I, I talk about how these valves were developed and engineered, we spent a lot of time doing what you would do as part of product development, which is to look at the performance of these valves over a range of conditions, a range of geometries, uh, and in a range of pressures. So the way we chose to evaluate these valves was to um, push the fluid at different pressures, one, two, three, four, and five PSI, and then look at the pressure required to actuate the diaphragm and uh, what pressure would be required on that diaphragm to close the valve. And what we found from those initial experiments was that with, uh, the rule was is it was about five to one. So if you had one PSI of fluid pressure, you needed about five PSI of, of air, of pneumatic pressure to completely close the valve. And so what we also did was then evaluate what the residual leak rate is of that valve. And that involved um, a very simple-minded experiment where the, once the valve was closed, uh, downstream of that valve, uh, connect a piece of tubing that has a pretty small ID 
get out a stopwatch and look at how long it took the fluid front to move uh, uh, across a, a certain length of tubing. And from that, you could back calculate what the leak rate was in microliters per minute. And uh, so if you look, you can see that um, as you get to the larger valve diameters at, say, 2 PSI, the fluid leak rate is around 0.06 microliters per minute. So that is about several orders of magnitude below what the, the fluid flow rate would be if the valve was open. And, and actually, those leak rates are pretty comparable to the leak rate of a regular solenoid valve. So we were pretty happy with the, uh, the designs and the strategy that we used for making these valves and demonstrating not just the performance of valves in one device manufactured in one lot, but then looking at valves and their performance over multiple lots produced at different times. So we were very pleased that the way we had designed it and, uh, and verified that showed that we had very consistent and pre precise functional performance uh, for these valves over a large number of devices. And, and that's why they're now really just dropping components into the system. So some of the other things that we've done with time is also to look at um, what if you use different thicknesses of the elastomer? How does that impact how well it closes? And so we found that if you go from a one mil film to a two mil, uh, you don't get very much change. But if you now go to a four mil film, then the leak rates increase substantially. And what that means practically is that the size of the valve seat has to be larger for a thicker membrane, which is um, a pretty uh, straightforward and easy conclusion um, because you just think about the deflection of the membrane into the valve seat that's required to close the valve. And then here on the, on the, down on the lower right is, is a demonstration chip that we have with one of the designs that we have for these valves, which we call the peanut uh, valve, that uh, is a, a chip that will draw in the fluid here, and then you can pump it through to this reservoir. So then uh, another aspect is to look at the onboard diaphragm pumps. And one of the things that we learned is you, you calculate what the expected dispense volume would be from a particular geometry of the pump, the, the diameter and the depth, and then look at the efficiency of that pump and the pump volume, the actual versus the calculated, and see where you are. And what we found was is that the smaller the radius, uh, the efficiency went down. So the radius over the height. So the smaller the radius versus the height, the less efficient the pump. So you need to really be at about a radius that's 10 times the height in order to easily get to 100% dispense efficiency on these pumps. So we use those as a, a design guide for how to right size pumps for different applications in these devices. So here's a, an example chip, I, I call this the, the M2D2 because it does metering, mixing, debubbling, and dispensing of the fluid. Uh, this was part of a demonstration program we did uh, several years ago where we um, were asked to show that you could do a four to one dilution, that we could demonstrate mixing, and then debubble so that when this fluid gets sent to the detection area, you could use a simple spectroscopic method to determine uh, if the if the if the mixing what the mixing ratio actually was, and then also how good was the, the mixing overall. And uh, the way they did that was to do transmission measurements in different parts of 
this flow chamber. And we were able to adequately demonstrate that you could get quantitative results and, and good mixing. And then this is another example. So I think one of the nice successes we've had with the onboard pneumatic valves is to be able to create a, um, a fluid manifold that's used for dispensing gradient concentrations of different inputs to do cell culture experiments in, downstream in a cell culture chamber. So um, this just kind of shows visually how this works. This has been speeded up eight times, but we have three different fluid inputs and then we can choose having valves open or closed to get different dispenses through the different outputs. And of course, by looking at the logic tree in the fluid network, in the pneumatic network, you can combine different parts of, of the, um, the different valves can have more than one airline in order to get to some fairly sophisticated actuation protocols. And so the result of this is, uh, is a product that's a component in this uh, cell culture system that uh, was developed by BioRep Technologies and it contains the valve laminate which is uh, bonded into an injection molded housing with these um, fluid inserts here and this whole unit is part of this instrument and is a semi-consumable so it gets installed and then operated over the course of a week and then is replaced at, at the end of a set of experiments. So as I, I mentioned, the, the valves themselves and the fact that you can use these um, flexible layers inside the microfluidic also means that you have, with these four different pressure states, an opportunity to do um, a lot of sophisticated fluid movement because you can manage the actuation protocol. And you can get 95% of the performance by uh, optimizing the design and having a, a basic protocol. But if you really spend some time optimizing the actuation protocol in the chip, you can get some really um, unexpected and uh, pretty exquisite performance out of a fairly basic pneumatic network of valves. And so by way of an example, um, I want to show you part of what was in the development of this chemical processor chip. And this was a, a program we worked with um, Peter Willis at JPL. Um, Peter had designed this chemical processor to work with uh, glass and PDMS, but he was interested in understanding if the same sort of strategy could be done in the technology that we have. So we worked with his group to, to develop this plastic chip that would fit into their, their instrument platform. Uh, so what this chemical processor does is it has any number of inputs here. Uh, now around the perimeter are the air lines that are used to actuate the valves. But uh, here above and below this array of valves are the inputs and outputs where uh, different chambers would go, um, different reservoirs would go to be able to pull liquid in from different locations, combine it, mix it by having it move around in this array of valves and then output it to any location that you desire. And to do that, all you do is change the actuation routine and the pneumatic control. So um, we worked with Peter to come up with a, a modification of our basic valve design that rather than having two vias to connect channels, we now had four. So there were consequences of that for the functional performance of the chip. And um, so the, the way to solve those problems 
as you'll see here. So if we start pumping across from the left to the right, you can begin to see that you get leaking across the valves into the adjacent channels. And this, of course, was not a, uh, a performance that was really <laughs> desired. So how could we get rid of that? And if you look at the design of the, the chip itself, there's, there's really no way to do it by changing the geometry of the valve. Um, what we had to do really was to modify the actuation routine and the way that we applied pressure in this network uh, allowed us to prevent leaking into adjacent channels. So I, I point this out because there, there's the performance you get with the basic specifications for, for these pneumatic valves, but then there's the next level of performance that you can achieve by uh, tweaking the actuation protocol. So um, we, we've been able to use tweaks in the actuation protocol to do things like get liquids to fill in geometries where it's typically hard to get them to fill and um, to get rid of bubbles in ways that you wouldn't think that you could easily get rid of them. So the instrument control adds a lot to the entire system and allows you to get to performance that is unexpected if you just looked at the design by itself. So that's why in, in when we think about how, how to design these products and get good performance, so we really want to drive to getting instrumented control as early in the program as possible. So um, the, the pneumatic controller that we developed in-house, we call the ADEPT. It's meant to be a kind of a breadboard system. It has a lot of bells and whistles on it so that you can do a lot of variations like change the pressure, change the vacuum. Uh, this particular instrument has a heating platform. We've got toggle switches on the front so that if you want to manually toggle the, the uh, different inputs, pneumatic inputs, you can do that. Although, by and large, uh, instruments with toggle switches we only use internally. Most of our customers will just work with the computer control. Um, and then here we have the temperature controller. But uh, ultimately what you have is a, a development platform that specifies not just the instrument, some of the instrument pneumatic control components, but you've also uh, help to characterize what the cartridge interface to the instrument should be and how you should um, how, how you should have the pneumatics bust onto the chip. So that all then plays into this whole device architecture. So I'll go back to this where the, the smart laminate which has the, the valve layer in it is part of this here. Um, the air lines would typically be in a molded part, but the nice thing is is that the air lines to get all of this exquisite control in the fluid circuit can all be bussed to the edge of the chip, just like you would bust the uh, um, electronic circuit lines in a printed circuit board. What this does is it really frees up all of this area on the top and the bottom of the chip to interface different electromechanical components, whether that would be for heating, for optical detection. So uh, you're not encumbered by having mechanical actuators to open and close valves. You can have everything bust to the edge of the cart. And because we like working with these pressure sensitive adhesives, um, getting bonding between this and any electroactive or optical component is very straightforward, robust, and easy to do, and easy to do in a manufacturing sense. So um, I guess I, I want to talk a little bit now then about the quality assurance and how what goes into what we do to ensure that what we deliver to our customers 
has the quality that they expect. Um, so first of all, we have uh, a list of, of approved vendors and they provide us raw materials with certificates of conformance. So what this means is that we're not buying materials from McMaster Car because you can't get lot control on the things that they sell. Um, you have to go with suppliers that uh, are selling large quantities of this material and they have it on hand readily. Um, we have to measure and define the acceptable stack tolerances. So we have to do XY measurements on the devices when they're manufactured and create rejection criteria. And um, finally, what we need to do, especially for the valve devices, is to create pressure decay tests that will allow us to certify whether an array of valves in that product that I showed you do doesn't have any leaks. Uh, so we've developed ways of uh, allowing us to, to test and certify the products that we build with certificates of conformance to our customers because we've created these uh, quality metrics that we apply to 100% of the parts that we produce. The nice thing about this is that all of the metrics that we've created and the measurements that we make on stack tolerances are, are, imp are an important part of the product transfer package to high volume manufacturing. So when we take our designs that have been manufactured using a batch manufacturing process, and we want to translate that and send that off to our partner for high volume manufacturing, they want to know how they should expect to do quality assurance on the parts that they're producing. So the data that we produce on quality then can be used by our volume partners to help them design the best high volume system possible. So I get in summary uh, for these drop in plug, plug and play components, uh, we first had developed and established a rapid prototyping technology that, that scales seamlessly for pilot scale production. Um, because we have well-defined processes and good control and good in-process quality, that has allowed us to engineer these different fluid circuit elements and to offer them to clients as a literal plug and play component. And with that, we also provide an instrument that will allow our customers to create the uh, actuation protocols that are needed to run whatever the assay workflow is. So in addition to having those components uh, and optimizing the actuation protocol, we work with customers to integrate the reagents and get the blister packs and so on so that customers will um, get very early, have a, a cartridge with design for manufacturer considerations in the design choices. So um, I hope that was a, a useful description and helpful as you think about how you would be wanting to develop your own products and the considerations that you should think about as you embark on that exciting journey to developing a new product. Thank you for your attention. Happy to uh, answer any questions and uh, the contact information is up at the, uh, on the first slide, which I will provide to you separately. Thank you.